This semester we are going through the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit as Paul lays out in Galatians. And tonight we will be talking through kindness, kindness. And you can find our scripture reading tonight in the book of Ephesians on page 951 if you're in the Pew Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30, verses 31 through 32. Hear, friends, the word of the Lord. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Friends, this is the word of our dear Lord, and we all say together, thanks be to God. Thank you. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing, be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Will you help me? Will you say this with me? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Keep going. There's another line in there. Come on. That was a mess. Wow. <laughs> We're several weeks into our series now on the fruit of the Spirit. If you've missed any of those first few, love, joy, peace, and patience, well, we have a podcast now. You can go and listen to those sermons or re-listen to them if you were here. Tonight, we're going to look at this fruit of the Spirit called kindness, kindness. And there's something I have to get cleared up right away before I go any further into this message. Kindness is not to be confused with niceness. Have you heard this? Uh, Be nice. My mom used to say this thing to me. Maybe your your parents said something like this. If you can't say anything nice, don't don't say anything at all. Yeah, you've heard this before. Sometimes I think Christianity um, gets misunderstood as just basically this big command over your life to be nice. Oh, I I know what this sermon tonight is going to be about. It's going to be about being nice. I'm telling you, that's not really what the fruit of the spirit of kindness is. Niceness is fine, I guess. But niceness is a little bit like fool's gold. And kindness is the real thing of real value. You can be nice without being truly kind. And we're going to discover today in God's Word what kindness really is, the fruit of the Spirit, this thing that only God can do in us. It's way better, it's way deeper, it's way richer than mere niceness. I want to remind us of um, the fact that when we bear fruit, when the Holy Spirit can bear fruit in us, there's a preceding act that has to happen. And we've been looking at this as we've been looking at Galatians all semester. And it's this hard-to-understand concept of dying to ourselves. We actually just sang it together. Lord, make me more like Jesus. Crucify my flesh and its desires. We die to ourselves like a seed that goes into the ground has to die so that when it receives the nutrients of the soil, then it might grow and bear much fruit. We die to ourselves in order to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We no longer make it all about us. We get over ourselves, as we've been seeing all the way through Galatians. And there's another metaphor besides this this grain dying in the soil and then growing to bear much fruit. There's a similar kind of metaphor that the New Testament uses, and it's that we actually have a whole new wardrobe that comes on. Our old self wore a certain kind of spiritual clothing, and our new self gets a new wardrobe, a new identity. And it's that metaphor that the Apostle Paul is working with in the book of Ephesians, which is what we're in tonight. If you go back a few verses in Ephesians, if your Bible's still open, 
uh, or it'll be on the screen behind me. Ephesians 4 verse 22 is talking about putting on this new wardrobe. It says this, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We were just singing about this. Lord, make me like your image. I need a new identity. I need a new wardrobe. I don't, you guys were probably born in like the early 2000s, most of you. So you probably don't know the, the, uh, the television programming in the early 2000s unless you've seen it on reruns. But back in the day, in the early 2000s, there was this really popular type of show, and it was called a, a makeover show. There was one called Extreme Makeover. Uh, it, actually, have you heard of this, Extreme Makeover? Have you seen this? I see a few heads nodding. What you would do is you, you'd, you'd have a friend, right? And the friend just had a t terrible wardrobe. They just didn't know how to dress. So you'd call a television producer. This is not kind, by the way. You'd call a television producer, and you would say, my friend needs an extreme makeover. And they'd show up with their cameras, and they would show up with these fashion people, and they would go into the closet of your friend, and they would take all of the clothes that they deemed ugly, and there, were, there was always a lot of drama around this, and they would throw the old ugly clothes onto a big pile, and they would get rid of all the old ugly clothes that was no longer going to define this person, and then they would take them shopping and they would get an extreme makeover, okay? And by the end of the show, the friend would have a whole new wardrobe. It's kind of similar to what the Bible is describing here. It says, put off, put off your old self, the way you used to behave before you were transformed by Jesus, and put on this new clothing, this new spiritual identity. That's what's happening right here in Ephesians. So what we're going to see then in this, uh, these two scriptures that Shomari read, we're going to see a laundry list of the old clothes, the type of things that we're tempted to do if we're just operating in our own self-motive. It's a laundry list. It's like that, that extreme makeover, throwing all the old, ugly clothes onto the pile. Shomari read for us this list. I want us to look at it again in verse 31 where it says, put away from you, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. I'm going to take a moment and describe to you what each of these words are, this old clothing that we're supposed to cast off like we're getting an extreme makeover. I want to spend just a moment on each one of these. I, I opened up a lot of books this week trying to understand the difference between all of these words in this list, this laundry list. In the context for when we tend to put on these old clothes is when we've been hurt, when we've been sinned against. Think of how we respond when we are sinned against. This is what we do if we're wearing the old clothes. It says, put away all bitterness. Bitterness. Bitterness is reminiscent of having like a taste in your mouth, like a bitter taste. It's when we've been harmed, when we've been sinned against, we kind of have this lingering bad taste in our mouth. It's bitter. And what we often end up doing with that bitter taste in our mouth is we feel bitter against the person who sinned against us. We call that unforgiveness. And here's the thing I learned years ago about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness, or bitterness, is like drinking poison, hoping it will kill the other person. Have you heard this before? Unforgiveness is like drinking poison, thinking it will kill the other person. The Bible says, God says, put that off. That's the old clothes before you were transformed by Christ. Bitterness and then wrath. Wrath comes next. When I read the word wrath in the Bible, I, I immediately think of like this righteous indignation of God the Father when he sees all the sinfulness of the world. That's not the wrath that's being used here in Ephesians. This is more like, you know when something happens to you and you're really upset when it first happens and you kind of see red? Maybe a better word would have been ire. You know, like when your emotions just flood when something has happened to you, you're just wrath, you're full of wrath. It's like a fit of rage comes over you. 
And then the next word is anger. And anger is not that initial fit of rage, that ire, that wrath, that emotional flooding that comes. Anger is the sustained sense of wrath. And what begins to happen in this sustain, it can go on for days and months, sometimes even much longer. When we hold on to angerness, it's a little bit like the bitterness we were just talking about. But bitterness is that bad taste in your mouth, it's that unforgiveness. But anger, when it's sustained, it begins desiring something. It begins desiring vengeance. It begins thinking about, how am I going to get this person back for what they did to me? Bitterness, wrath, anger, and then that next word, wrangling. That's a word we don't use every day. Wrangling. In other translations, it uses the word clamor or noisy whining. Do you ever experience somebody who's been hurt, they've been sinned against, and it's all they can talk about? That's wrangling. It's clamor. And then inevitably, if it's something that it's something that someone can all they can talk about, what happens next is the next word on the list: slander. Slander is just another word for lying. You've been hurt, you've been sinned against, you're feeling bitter, the wrath has gone away, but you have sustained anger. You're talking about it all the time, and you begin just to tell lies about the person who hurts you. And then this last one on the list, malice. You know what malice is? Malice is, um, you know, during anger, you began desiring vengeance or revenge, but malice is actually making plans. It's making plans to get the person back. It's scheming to harm the person who harmed you. There's a depiction of this in Psalm 36, verse 4, where it says, They plot mischief while on their beds. They are set on a way that is not good. They do not reject evil. They plot mischief along the beds. Do you ever have it where you're tossing and turning on your pillow? You've been harmed. You've been sinned against. You're feeling all these things on this list, and you're tossing and turning on your pillow, and you're like, why I oughta? And you begin making plans of what you're going to do to get the person back. In Psalm 36, it says they're not rejecting evil when those thoughts are coming over them. I want you to see the brilliance of the Bible because all of these words, they kind of build on each other, don't they? You can almost see it like a steam train building up energy. Bitterness, wrath, anger, wrangling, slander, and malice it builds up to this energy that makes us want to repay evil for evil. We've been harmed, we've been hurt, we've been sinned against, and this is the natural human response. We want to get them back. We want to repay evil for evil. And it's understandable that we would feel that way. And this is really how the world works. This is why wars are started. But the gospel, but the gospel speaks a different word. It gives us a different move than repaying evil for evil. Look at the way the verse continues. The sentence continues in verse 32. I'm going to read verse 31 again just to hear it in context. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. This doesn't say be nice to the person who's harmed you or sinned against you. It says be kind to one another. So what is kindness then? What does it look like? How are we to respond if not to repay evil with evil? Be kind to one another. Well, the definition comes right here in the verse. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving. Tender-hearted and forgiving. There's two things here I want us to unpack. What does it mean to be kind? When we've been harmed, when we've been sinned against, how do we be kind to the person who's done that to us? We are tender-hearted in our response. What does that mean? Well, throughout the Bible, there's examples of people who have hard hearts. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Maybe you remember that story from the Old Testament. People's hearts get hardened. Well, this is a tender heart. I was thinking about this visually, as I try to often do when I read the Bible. I've been told that the human heart is around the size of the, the fist. 
Are there any biology majors here? Is that true? We're going to go with it. I was thinking about this, like to be tender-hearted. To be hard-hearted means that you're closed off. Your heart is closed off. It's hard, right? And when it's hard-hearted, when your heart is closed off, it's impervious to any inputs coming toward it. All it can do is, is throw things off of it. Things like bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander and malice. You see, those are all kind of coming out from the heart as defense mechanisms. But to be tender-hearted is to actually receive inputs. It's to actually f- acknowledge the hurt. It's to, in my family, we, say, we have this phrase, I don't know if this is a common phrase or if it's just in my household, but we say, I'm going to go feel my feels. I need to go feel my feels. Sometimes we just give that as a signal to the other members of the family, and we just let the person go feel their feels. In other words, to have a tender heart means we allow ourselves to feel our feels, to say this sad thing, this bad thing that happened makes me sad. It makes me hurt. That's what it means to be tender-hearted. This is a little bit counterintuitive, right? You think when you've been hurt, when you've been sinned against, you've got to harden your heart, you've got to protect yourself. But to be kind to that person, the first move is actually to be tender-hearted. And then it goes even deeper, it gets even harder in the next move. Forgive one another. Forgive one another. This is a hard thing to hear. Hear me now, I am not, the Bible is not saying, God is not saying, and I am not saying that you should allow people to hurt you. You have to draw boundaries, okay? When my kids were little, when they were toddlers, I'm picturing them right now as little toddlers. When they were toddlers, here's the thing about toddlers. I don't know if any of you like babysit or have little siblings at home. Toddlers, man, they are little sinners. (laughs) They're cute, but they sin. Think about this. Do you ever have, do you have to teach a kid? You have to teach a kid how to steal? No, you have to teach them how to share. See what I mean? They're sinners. When my kids were, were little, little frickin' sinners in our household, they would, they would like, you know, they would do what toddlers do. They do what humans do. They would sin against each other, and they would like steal the toy, or they'd smack the other, or whatever. They're toddlers, you know? And, uh, and we would do what most parents would do. We would say, what do you say? And then one toddler would say, I'm sorry. And the other toddler would be prompted to respond to that. Now, in most households, the response goes something like this. I'm sorry. And the other toddler says, it's okay. But we did something in my house. This was my wife's idea. She's a brilliant parent. She said, don't say it's okay. Say, I forgive you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. Because here's the thing. It's not okay. It's not okay to steal your sibling's toy or to smack your sibling or to sin against the other. So when we say, when someone says to us, I'm sorry, the nice thing to say is it's okay. But the kind thing to say is I forgive you. And this became such a, a, like a, a common thing in my household that even to this day, with it, when anybody says, I'm sorry, even when it's like a small thing, like I, you, know, you bump somebody walking through the kitchen, you say, oh, I'm sorry. The other person says, I forgive you. This is like a common thing in my, in my house. This is, we, we, you probably think we're weird if you came over to our house. But being kind means feeling the feels, saying, that hurt me. And I forgive you. And it doesn't mean you're allowed to hurt me again because it's not okay what you did. I'm not going to be nice about it, but I'm going to be kind. You guys see the difference? Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. And here's the key here's the key. If I sent you off with only that word, you would try this kindness thing and you would fail. And so would I except for this next part of the sentence. Forgiving one another, it says. As God in Christ has forgiven you. You See, this is a similar pattern to last week's message where we talked about patience, 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 and then we turned our focus, we turned our attention at the end to the patience of God. The same thing's happening here from the brilliant biblical text. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Do you guys see what happened on the cross? 
Jesus wasn't being nice. He was being kind. He was receiving the sins of the whole world. He was letting it hurt. He was taking the consequences of all of our sins upon himself. And one of the things he said as he was hanging there on the cross was, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He was forgiving us while he was dying in our place for the sins that we committed. And this is the most, this is what we call the gospel. This is the deep and wonderful and amazing and mysterious and beautiful truth of the gospel. And it means actually that we can go to Jesus for forgiveness. And it means that we can forgive each other. Romans 2, verse 4. Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? You know what repentance is? If you were here for the very first gathering of the semester, you heard this. As we, as we go to the communion table, and I'm going to invite Jennifer up to lead us in communion in just a moment, but I want to just, as we prepare to go to the communion table, I want to remind you of what we talked about at the first gathering. If you weren't here, I'll give you a recap. Repentance simply means turning. Repentance means turning. You see, you can confess to God. You can say, Father, I have sinned against you. Pretend for a moment that God is right here beside me. I can confess to God. I can say, Father, forgive me. I've sinned. But repentance actually means turning. Repentance means I'm turning away from the ways, the wicked ways of my flesh, and I turn towards you. I turn back towards you. And you see this beautiful verse in Romans 2 says, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Why? Because we wouldn't turn to God through repentance if we didn't know that he was kind. And the fact that he offers his forgiveness freely to us is a demonstration of his kindness. So I don't know who has hurt you. I don't know who has sinned against you. I don't know what kind of bitterness you might be holding on to or unforgiveness, drinking poison, hoping it will kill the other person. But what would it look like tonight if you made your heart tender not to allow the person to hurt you anymore, but to say, that hurt that's not okay, and I forgive you. So that's if you've been sinned against, but I also don't know what kind of sin pattern is still existing in your life, what thing you have to turn away from, no longer just confessing it, but actually turning from that way, turning towards the kindness of God that's meant to lead you to repentance. But tonight, as you take communion, turn, repent. He's kind. He will forgive you. Let his kindness lead you and all of us to repentance. Amen.